Okay. Hello, everyone. So, stand by the mic. Uh, I'm going to talk to you today about the project I've been running to look at the role the vitamin D receptor has in skeletal muscle mass. So a little bit of background. Um, vitamin D we can get from primarily two, primarily two sources, either from the, through the diet or sunlight. This undergoes a series of hydroxylation steps in the liver and the kidneys, um, where it's effective upon target tissues, the classical ones being bone in the intestines, but newly emerging ones such as skeletal muscles and the immune system, um, we're seeing that it may have a role in these. So uh, essentially, vitamin D is proposed to have a positive role within skeletal muscle, within different populations as in elderly or athletes, we see that the supplementation may help or improve um, muscle function, and some studies have shown that there's a large cross-sectional areas um, in athletes that are supplemented with vitamin D. Depending on the populations you look at and their orientation in the world, the, um, up to 25 to maybe 40% of individuals are vitamin D deficient. Now, the vitamin D acts through the receptor and it auto-regulates its own expression and we've shown that the receptor is in fact expressive in skeletal muscle. Um, one recent paper looked at an acute uh, resistance exercise training and showed that the receptor expression increased um, directly after the uh, exercise at three to six hours, but then returned back down to basal levels after 24 hours. So there is a suggested role that the receptor has, well, has within skeletal muscle. So looking at uh, my project, we wanted to look at the role of the receptor within developed skeletal muscle, so we used a rat model. So um, essentially what we did is we either knocked down or overexpressed the receptor um, within the right legs of uh, seven rats. And these rat, rats act as internal controls with the left leg um, receiving an either an empty vector or a scrambled control sequence. So how we did this is we essentially injected lentiviral particles into the skeletal muscle, permeabilized the membrane by giving them um, a high voltage current um, through the muscle, and then actually driving the particles into it by doing a series of low voltage pulses. So this was done on day zero of the study. They were left for seven days where they were then administered a D2O bolus to, um, of the stable isotope to measure protein synthesis, and left, no, left another three days before sacrificing the animals and collecting the tissue. So preliminary, well, initially we wanted to look at the um, kind of amount of overexpression we have. So you can see at both the gene level measured by quantitative real-time PCR, we have this increase in the receptor expression that is quite variable between the animals, but that is um, due to the lentiviral technique we use. And we can see that it's matched by an increased protein expression measured by amino blotting. <coughs> then looking at the, um, the actual fibres and the physiological effects it may have, when staining for them, uh, we did say um, a green dystrophin stain to see the um, fibre boundaries and then the stain for red for VDR. So we can see this marked increase in receptor expression in the other expression group. And when measuring the actual cross-sectional areas of the fibres, we see this apparent hypertrophy of the fibres which is matched by an increase in total protein content, which is normalized to the dry weight of the muscle. And then measuring the D2O incorporation, we see that there's an increase in um, the mixed lysate um, fraction, but then looking at the different subcellular fractions, we see there's an increase in the myofibular and the sarcoplasmic fractions. So looking at the mechanisms behind this, we screened the anabolic um, pathway of AKT mTOR and can see that there's an increase in the total expression of these intermediates as well as the levels of their phosphorylation. Namely, we, we do see these increases, um, everything downstream of mTOR. So looking at, um, and following that on, that there's a, a potential increase in anabolic capacity. We see there's an increase in the total RNA content within these muscles, which is matched by an increase in the ribosomal gene expressions, um, which again supports the role that, or well, the notion that there is an increased anabolic capacity within these animals. So looking at further measures of hypertrophy, we looked at the satellite cell content. Um, initially, we um, showed that there was no changes in the distribution of the fiber types um, within these muscles. But we did see that there was an increase in the satellite cell content per fiber. Um, it's, it's almost significant when generalized for all the fibers. But when digging down into it and looking at specifically 2X fibers, we do see this increase uh, in satellite cells per 2X fibers. This is matched by an increase in proliferative um, related gene expression, namely PAC7 and PCNA, and we do see this decrease in myostatin. 
So then looking at the next um, group of animals we had, we did where we did the knockdown. Again, we see uh, this um, about approximately 50% uh, reduction in the gene expression of the receptor, and the protein levels again matched about 50% as well. So looking at the, the roles that this would have in the muscle, we did the same measures. We measured the cross-sectional area, and we could see that it's decreased um, in these muscles and matched by a decrease in the alkaline soluble protein. Interestingly, however, we don't see a depression in the protein synthesis in the, in the mixed lysate fraction or any other fractions, uh, and there's no reduction in RNA content. We did do the uh, measures of the anabolic signaling and saw that there was largely no decrease in this. So if we're getting um, smaller muscle fibers and less protein, but it's not due to changes in anabolic uh, signaling, that this then is potentially going through breakdown-related targets, methods. So we screened the different breakdown methods, and um, we saw that there's an increase in autophagy-related gene expression of multiple intermediates. Um, so we get the gene expression of, of a few intermediates here, um, but then the protein-related expression, we see, do see this increase in autophagy-mediated um, degradation, namely um, so one of the um, good measures is LC3B2, um, where, where there's increased expression, we do see um, what's well, noted there's increased uh, autophagy going on. So this led us on to um, looking at the potential role that this has within humans. So we know that in an animal model, if, as I said before, if you exercise, we do see this increase in the receptor expression. So we what looked at um, some array data from a past study where 41 individuals were underwent a 20-week uh, resistance exercise training. Um, and looking at their pre and post uh, VDR gene expression, we do see this increase in the expression levels. This is matched by, an in, um, well, this is correlated with the individual um, increases in lean muscle, well, in lean mass changes. So kind of um, concluding all, all of this, when we overexpressed the receptor levels, we saw this increase in anabolic capacity and matched by the protein synthesis and ribosomal content. However, uh, when we decrease the receptor expression, we see this upregulation in autophagy, um, leading us to, um, to believe that there is actually a positive role for the vitamin D receptor within skeletal muscle. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone involved in this project and our collaborators with it.